When I lived in Louisville, Kentucky, I worked with Treble Kids in a group home uh, that had just been established. It was an exciting opportunity to invest in these teenage guys and help prepare them for these next stages of life. And my boss at the group home was a man named Brad. Um, he might come across just his presence as intimidating, but he was one of the most gentle and kind and grace-filled bosses that I ever had. And he was always asking us how we were, what we needed, and was joking with us. He was a great boss. Uh, one evening, at the group home, me and my coworker Alan had a brilliant idea. Uh, we really wanted to take the guys to see the new Batman movie, The Dark Knight. In reality, Alan and I just really wanted to see it. And the issue was some of the guys had to work that night. Some of them, uh, and some of the guys wanted to go to the campus and play basketball at this open gym. And so that's not a problem. We'll just drop these guys off, pick them up when the movie's over. And so that's what we did. Alan and I dropped off uh, almost all the kids and took like two of them to the movie theater. It was perfect. We were getting paid to watch Batman. We thought our plan had worked uh, out so well and sitting there eating popcorn, watching Joker terrorize Gotham. And so we got back to the group home. We found out that the gym was locked and they weren't playing that night. So the guys wanted to play basketball, had to sit around while we were at the movies. Then we found out that one of the guys got off work early, called the house for us to pick him up. We weren't there, obviously, and then sat outside in the dark of his job for like an hour waiting for us. And let's just say most of these boys in the group home were pretty angry with Alan and I. But what bothered me the most was the email I got that week. Uh, from Brad, this gentle and kind boss confronted us, and I remember sitting at the computer and reading the email he sent to Alan and I, and he blasted us for our lack of responsibility. He rebuked us for our immaturity and selfishness. He expressed his disappointment in us as staff of the group home. It was a tough confrontation, and Brad may have been kind, but he certainly wasn't a pushover. And I don't know about you, um, maybe you've been confronted by someone like that. Maybe you dropped the ball on someone that always seemed so gentle and kind. They just let you have it. Maybe it was a teacher or a parent or grandparent. It's startling to be confronted by someone that you didn't expect. And that is what we will walk into this morning. Jesus has been in the business of confronting people. Jesus is absolutely kind. For sure. He is absolutely loving, but he's also not a pushover. Jesus has a serious weight of authority, and he will throw it around as he sees fit. That's the message. Confronted by Christ, and then what our response to that confrontation must be. Uh, so we're going to be in Luke 20. This is the very end of this More Than a Parable series. If you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. If you have a bulletin, I think we, just a lot of scripture to go through this morning, I think we just have its own insert, insert into the bulletin. But before we read and discuss this passage, uh, let's pray together. Father, we uh, come before you and we plead for confrontation. God, we plead that we would be confronted by the power, the authority of the Scriptures. God, we pray that that confrontation might change how we think about things, how we process things in our life, how we think about our marriage and our friendships and the places that we work. God, that this confrontation would change how we think about you. God, this confrontation would cause us to live differently, to love differently, to repent differently. God, so we submit ourselves 
to your word this morning. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Jesus is making a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. As he's coming down from the Mount of Olives into the city, the people are praising his name in a loud voice. It's a scene from Palm Sunday that we often study. And Jesus, he begin to, begins to enter the city and he looks around with tears filling his eyes. Not tears of happiness, not tears of joy, the sound of celebration, tears of deep sadness for the city of Jerusalem. Tears that know the celebration, it will not last long and the enemy will destroy the city. And tears for the people that refuse to repent. So he enters the city and he heads to the temple to drive them out. And he cries out, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you made it a den of robbers. Meaning Jesus refuses for the temple to become a street market of overpriced items, ripping people off that are coming to worship. And so he violently and loudly drives them out. And to be honest, it's not the only time he's done it. He drives these merchants out and begins to teach daily in the temple. Picture that. I mean, that's some serious authority. Jesus, he's not some approved rabbi. Jesus isn't captain of the Pharisees. He comes in with confrontational weight and throws down his justice. And no one stops him. That's the crazy part. No merchant stands up against him. No leader pulls him aside and is like, hey, Jesus, we know you're mad, but you can, can you calm down a little? You're kind of scaring people. No one says any of that. No one stops him. He clears the temple and begins to teach. That's a leader with authority. But obviously, these religious leaders, they're not buying into that. This outsider isn't going to come into their temple and start doing whatever he wants. I mean, how dare he disrespects them? So in Luke 19, 47 through 48, we see the religious leaders begin to plot against Jesus. They want him gone. They want him destroyed. That's the plan, but they're really not sure how to do that quite yet until we get to chapter 20. So we'll start in verse 1. We're going to read the whole text, and then we'll walk through it. So Luke 20, starting in verse 1. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel... The chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things. Or who is it that gave you this authority? And he answered them, I will also ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, then all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. And when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. And so he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third, and this one also they wounded and cast out. And so the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son, perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let us kill him. So that the inheritance may be ours, and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the in owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, surely not. And he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And the scribes and the Pharisees sought to lay hands on him that, that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. If you're a note taker, I'm going to give you two routes when confronted by Christ. Two routes when confronted by Christ. I'm going to give you the first route 
that we see in the text. And since it's pretty dark, I'll show you the second route. So what's the first route that you and I can take when confronted by Christ? Number one, you don't believe what he teaches. You don't believe what he teaches. In verse 1, we see Jesus continuing to teach in the temple and preach the gospel. And these religious rulers, more specifically the leaders of the Sanhedrin, have finally formulated a plan to burn Jesus. And if I can be frank, it's a pretty stupid plan. It's a plan nonetheless. And so they asked Jesus publicly, tell us by what authority do you do these things? Or is it, or who gave this authority to you? And they're publicly calling out Jesus, trying to trap him in a public blasphemy. What authority do you have, Jesus, to run these merchants out of the temple? What authority do you have, Jesus, to be teaching every day here in this temple? It's a public trap, but Jesus doesn't get trapped. You don't stump God with clever, clever questions. So in turn, he asked them a question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Now that's a tough one. And these religious leaders, they huddle in the corner and brainstorm like this is some trivia night. And if we say from heaven, well, he'll ask, like, why don't we believe in him? And if we say from man, then all these John the Baptist fans around us will kill us. See, John the Baptist wasn't just a brief figure in the New Testament. This guy had a huge following, and many came to him to be baptized. And these religious leaders can either look like public hypocrites or get stoned to death. Not great options. And so they reply, we don't know. And he says, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So instead of looking like hypocrites or being killed, these religious leaders just look like public idiots. The ignorance is not clever, but honest. They truly did not know where this authority came from. They truly did not believe in what Jesus taught. So when confronted by Christ, you have the option. You have the option to believe in what he teaches or not. You and I do not get to choose Jesus, but not choose his word. So when, when, when Christ confronts you, He confronts you by His Word. You either believe in His Word or you don't. But they are not separated issues. Christ is Word, and we believe in His Word, or we don't. This past week, um, it's a weird sound behind me. Do y'all hear that? Okay. I was like, I don't know. I don't know if we're draining the baptistry here. I think that would be a terrible time to do it. But anyways, we'll just... Push it out of our minds and keep going. It does. It kind of sounds like a toilet flushing. That's that's distracting. All right. We're going to keep going. We'll ignore it. And if it gets louder, well, I'll get louder. All right. This past week, a former student posted something on Facebook about homosexuality. And the picture she posted said that homosexuality was just added to the Bible in 1983 and that Christians are just running a scam. Now, in fairness, in fairness like I almost never comment on that stuff because Facebook is the worst place to have an honest discussion, but I posted anyway. And I shared a few articles about how we use the Greek New Testament and how the words were translated. And I shared that I believe that homosexuality is a sin according to the scriptures. And she was very kind in her response back to me. But someone else replied to my comment. And this person wrote, I think you should leave what is and isn't a sin to your God. It's never anyone's place to determine that. It's judgment, honestly. Whose job is it to judge? Not trying to be rude or anything. And I didn't reply to that because, again, Facebook is not a great place for discussion. But it reminded me of the truth of the word. She was right. It's not my place to judge unbelievers, and I don't. But believing in the word as the ultimate truth is not being judgmental. It is having an absolute conviction on the absolute authority of Christ. And I do believe there is a great movement away from the Word of God and our culture. And the worst part is that it's coming from other people that claim to be believers. 
So let me be very clear here. You don't get to believe in Jesus, but not believe in his word. They're the same. And when you're confronted by Christ, you are confronted by his word. And one route you can take is just not to believe what he teaches. And if you're listening to this message, it is no doubt that you also line up with point two. You reject the source of his authority. You reject the source of his authority. That's one route. These religious leaders, they don't believe, they don't understand his authority, they reject Christ. And so Jesus, he begins to share this parable. And as I mentioned many times in this series, a parable is not always an allegory. Honestly, it rarely is. But in this case, Jesus is using this parable as an allegory. Let me explain. There's this guy that planted a vineyard. And he rented out the vineyard to some tenants and then left to another country for a long time. And when the time finally came, the owner of the vineyard sent a servant to the tenants to collect some of the fruit that was produced. And these tenants, they didn't have any fruit, so they beat up the guy and sent him away with nothing. So there's this other servant that sent. They also beat him up, treated him shamefully, and sent him away with nothing. As you can tell, the situation continues to escalate. A third servant was sent, and they wounded that guy and sent him away. So three servants, no fruit to be shown, and the owner asked, what shall I do? Well, I'll send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But instead, these wicked tenants saw the son and said to themselves, there he is. That's the owner's son. That's the heir. Let's kill him so the inheritance will be ours. And that's exactly what they did. They threw the guy out of the vineyard and killed him. This parable is an allegory. So let me go through some of the characters and we'll talk about it. This is the parable characters. The owner of the vineyard is God. The owner of the vineyard is God. The vineyard is the nation of Israel that God chose as his covenant people. The tenants are the false religious leaders. The servants are these Old Testament prophets. And the owner's son, is, as you might guess, is Jesus. So let's play that one out, okay? Jesus is telling us in this parable that God chose the nation of Israel as his covenant people. And Israel was led astray by evil prophets and priests and kings. You can read about it all throughout the Old Testament. And Israel did often not bear fruit as God's people. And God sent prophets to warn the nation of Israel to repent. And Israel often rejected these prophets and even tried to kill him. So God sent his beloved son, Jesus, and the religious leaders will kick Jesus out of Jerusalem and kill him on a cross. It is a very profound and offensive parable for the people of Israel and for us today. God, throughout human history, has sent servants with authority to warn his people to repent. And the people continue to reject the messenger sent by the authority of God. And so Jesus, the beloved son, is sent with authority as God. This is what Matthew 28, 18 says. And Jesus came and said to him, "Then all authority, all of it, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All things were created through him, by him, for him. Christ has all authority. He has authority to create, forgive, destroy before Jesus. Heals this paralytic man in the gospel of Matthew. He says to this room of people in Matthew 9, starting in verse 6. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid. And they glorified God who had given such authority to men. So this beloved is sent to the vineyard to look for fruit, but finds nothing but hostility. It is spoken of from the prophet Isaiah. If you look at Isaiah 5, starting in verse 1, let me sing for my beloved. My love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill, and he dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed it out of wine, of wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it only yielded wild grapes. The beloved son finds nothing but wild grapes, certainly no fruit worth keeping. 
When confronted by Christ, the religious leaders reject his authority, cast him out of the city and kill him on a cross. That's certainly one route to take when confronted by Christ. I do not speak to you this morning in my own authority. I'm a 35-year-old preacher with a weak beard that barely passed Greek and Hebrew and seminary. So if you came to church to listen to some guy speak of his own authority, you don't understand the corporate gathering of the saints. We gather in person to hear the authority of Christ and his word. So every week when I teach the word, you aren't confronted by me. That would bring no lasting change. You are confronted by the authority of Christ. And like the parable, you can reject the source of his authority. And if I can be blunt, that route does not end well. If you choose not to believe his teaching, and if you choose to reject his author- the, the authority of Christ, number three, you're destroyed in your unbelief. You are destroyed in your unbelief. In the second half of verse 15, it appears that Jesus finishes the the teaching of this parable and begins to share the concluding application with these religious leaders. And Jesus says to the leaders, what will the owner of the vineyard do? What will the owner do to those that have killed his son? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Without going into too much detail, that is a prophecy from Christ that happened in that time frame and will happen again. In AD 70, the Roman general Titus led a siege against Jerusalem and the Romans broke out through the city, slaughtering the people and destroying the second temple. And as Jesus had wept over and said they would, There's only one wall that stands at the temple today, today, the western wall, the old city of Jerusalem that people still go and pray to. The point is, Jesus prophesied that those in Jerusalem would be destroyed for their rejection of him. And that's exactly what happened. And the message of the gospel began to spread to the Gentiles, which is why Jesus said in verse 16 that this vineyard would be given to others. And as Jesus, he's sharing this explanation in Luke 20, the men around him are in shock and they said loudly, like, surely not us. Surely God won't destroy us. But remember, Jesus, he is kind and loving, but he ain't a pushover. And he looked at these men in the face and he quotes Psalm 118.22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the stone that bore the weight of the stress of two walls built upon it. Without the cornerstone, the building collapses. So Jesus, he's telling these religious leaders, I am the cornerstone prophesied from the ages. I am the rock, the stone that you have rejected. And if you reject me, eventually I will destroy you. So the scribes and the chief priests are disgusted. They realize Jesus, he's talking about them, and they sought to end his life right there, but they were scared of the people around him. And while the truth of this destruction is played out in AD 70, it's a truth that still stands for everyone today, that the message of the gospel is not just for some people, it's for all people, and the message of Christ is for the nations. So listen carefully to the warning of Jesus that has already proved true for some. If you take the route of unbelief of the word and rejection of Christ, you will be eventually destroyed in your unbelief. And I'm not trying to threaten anyone or scare anyone with religion. I am trying to share what Jesus Christ has promised us. He doesn't make threats. He makes promises. If you choose unbelief and rejection, you will eventually be destroyed by Christ. The cornerstone will eventually crush you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 9. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. And when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints, and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. 
when confronted by Christ, that's one route you can take. For sure. Unbelief, rejection, destruction, that is the wide route that many take today. I was texting this friend uh, this past week about this message, feeling pretty self-conscious about the message because I know it could be heavy, uh, possibly confusing. And my buddy he texted me, well, why don't you just turn the message into two weeks? I said, I, I can't do that. That means the message on Sunday would end with, you are destroyed in your unbelief. Have a great week. Happy Fourth of July. And so we're not going to end today on being destroyed. Let me quickly show you another route to take when confronted by Christ. So here's the or. Here's the other route. Number one, you believe in the gospel. You believe in the gospel. Romans 10, starting in verse 14. How then will they call on him on whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all believed the gospel or obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. And so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so right now, right now you are being confronted by the gospel through the authority of Christ's word. Jesus, the, the Son of God, died on a cross for our sin and came back from the grave after three days. It's the simplicity of the gospel. And it doesn't matter if you grew up in the South and you heard that your entire life. Do you actually believe it to be true? Christ died for you and came back from the grave. Believe the good news that is being preached to you. Don't sit in church your entire life pretending to be a good little Christian so you can feel better about yourself and not actually believe the cornerstone of why we are even here. Don't act like the religious leaders that heard the teaching of Jesus every day in the temple and heard the gospel but refused to believe. The life-changing, eternity-changing route when being confronted by Christ is to believe in the gospel. Secondly, you repent for the forgiveness of sins. You repent for the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples and said this in Luke 24. Starting in verse 44, then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all the nations. Being confronted by Christ means confessing your sin, turning from sin, and being forgiven of sin by the work of Christ. When Jesus confronts you in the darkness of your own heart and your response is repentance, Jesus offers you complete forgiveness. Don't you want that? Many of us want that, but we don't even operate in that. If you have repented and Christ has forgiven, Christ is not confronting you to beat you up and make you feel like a loser. Christ is not confronting you to remind you of your past failures, even the failures of this past week, when Christ is confronting you so you can repent and be forgiven. And if that's the route you take, you are no longer defined by your past, but now defined by Christ. You aren't defined by abuse that you endured. 
by the addiction that you battle, by the greed and anger that you wrestle with, when you repent, you are forgiven of sins. It's a kind of confrontation that offers you freedom. That is what we receive. That is what the confrontation of the nation begin with not political ideology or economic opinions. We confront the nations with the message of repentance for their forgiveness of sins. And I hope to God that he starts sending people from East River Park to do just that. Lastly, three, you bear fruit in keeping with repentance. You bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Being confronted by Christ means you bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It was the message of the wilderness in the wilderness from John the Baptist. In Luke 3, beginning in verse 8, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Do you want to know why the tenants keep beating up the servants coming to the vineyard? Because the owner wants fruit from his vineyard and they don't have any. At best, they've got some wild grapes, but they don't, definitely don't have any lasting fruit. True fruit bearing does not happen without repentance. You can grow fake fruit. You can grow accidental fruit. If you try hard enough, you can have some wild grapes. You can have a church with a big building, lots of people, and a large budget. You can have a life of service and loving your neighbor. You can be successful in the eyes of American Christian culture and have nothing to show for it but some wild grapes. True, lasting fruit that the beloved Son comes seeking is only found in keeping with repentance. If you are listening and thinking, why isn't God working in my life? Why, do, why does God just feel so far away sometimes? Why isn't God using me in ministry? Why am I not seeing a difference in my life that other people are seeing? Let me kindly say, if you're asking those questions, it's because you have not been repenting like you should. We are not a perfect church. Pretty sure the dirty red carpet gives that one away. I'm not a perfect pastor. I don't think I have to convince you of that. Every elder, deacon, staff member knows that I'm far from perfect. But we can be a people that are quick to repent. We can be a people that when confronted by Christ and His Word are quick to turn from sin and turn to Him. When confronted by Christ, you bear fruit in keeping with repentance. There really is no other way. One afternoon, uh, I decided to take the kids hiking. Uh, Corey was stuck at home, and I didn't really, or stuck at work, and I didn't really feel like being stuck at home with these kids. And so we went on a little East Tennessee adventure, and we started off on a trail that I was familiar with, and then we noticed this sign for a trail that we'd never been on. So I told the kids, let's do it. we got plenty of time. Let's see where this thing goes. So we start hiking and hiking and hiking and hiking. And I'm thinking, all right, this isn't really any fun anymore. And the kids start complaining. I have to pee. Pee on that tree. I need water. Here's Take a sip of water. And we kept hiking and hiking and hiking, and they kept complaining and complaining and complaining. And I wanted to see where this trail led, but it, it just felt like it never ended. And so we finally stopped at this point to take a rest, and I pulled the kids. All right, we've got two options here. We've got two routes to take. We can keep going, see where this trail leads, or we can start walking back to the van, but we have to make a decision. Of course, my daughter wanted to keep going. She'd probably hike the entire AT if I let her. But the boys had enough, and they convinced their sister, and so we decided to walk back to the van. Still don't know where that trail goes. And the reality is, when Christ confronts you, there is no indecisiveness. We do not get to be complacent in the situation when Christ confronts you, you have to make a choice. 
You don't get to sit out in the woods hoping something works out for you. Christ forces your hand. Choose a route this morning. Christ has confronted all of us through his word. So you can choose not to believe what he teaches. You can reject the source of his authority and you can be destroyed in your own belief. Or you can believe in the gospel you can repent for the forgiveness of sins and you can bear fruit in keeping with repentance, but you do not get to be neutral. One route will get you destroyed. One route will bear eternal fruit confronted by Christ. What's your, what are you going to do? And if you have any questions about the parable or the teaching this morning, or would like someone to pray for you, um, or if you said, I've never really made that choice, I would like to choose that route, please come talk to me. I'll, I'd love to talk with you and pray for you. But uh, let's sing together. Let's pray and then we'll sing together before we leave.